Okay, uh, we're going to talk about the lipotoxemia theory of Nathan Pritikin. And this is really big stuff. This is the idea of understanding diseases. And you really want to try to understand a disease as much as possible because then it tells you what to do to avoid getting a disease. Basically, if you understand a disease and what causes it, quite often that cause is something avoidable. You avoid the cause and then you don't get the disease. Quite often the same thing that prevents the disease is useful for treating it once you do have the disease. Not always, but quite often that's the case. And so I would consider this one of the major, major mechanisms of disease. And it's actually a beautiful physiological principle that can really help you avoid a lot of disease. Because there's some people who age fantastic. There's super centenarians, centenarians, 105, 110 years of age with zero medical problems. Whereas I can tell you, I've been a doctor 30 years. I see the average American and they're already messed up with all kinds of problems just in their early 50s, sometimes in their 40s. I've seen tons of multi-stroke infarct dementias in their 40s. I've seen lots of hypertensive related extensive destruction of the brain in the early 50s even. So the good news is I've seen tons of clean, perfect looking brains 80 years old, all right? So you want to be one of those people who's got a beautiful looking brain at 80 and who's still uh, full of vitality and going. And understanding this lipotoxemia theory of Nathan Pritikin is gonna help. Okay, so you know, back in the 1940s and 50s, Ansel Keys had already figured out from epidemiology, he studied over 25 countries. The high fat eating countries had lots of atherosclerosis, which means coronary artery disease, impotence, hypertension, obesity, diabetes. Okay, the low fat countries didn't have it. Even if they smoked cigarettes like the Japanese, and they ate a lot of salt like the Japanese, the fact that they had a low fat diet was protective. Same thing also with the Papua New Guinea people. They were also smoking a lot, but they had a real good diet, eating tons and tons of sweet potatoes, and they really hadn't, didn't have much atherosclerosis. Now, Dennis Burkett was a missionary physician who had been initially trained in Ireland, then England, and then he was in Africa, and he helped trace the pattern of a, a jaw tumor that got named after him called Burkitt's lymphoma, the relevance being that he then was uh, put in charge of you know, hundreds of hospitals for the epidemiology. And Peter Cleave and Utrell were other physicians that worked with Dennis Burkett. Actually, Alex Walker did too. I forgot to mention his name. But they had different theories about disease because they saw a totally different pattern of disease in the Westerners like the English that were in Africa versus the persons from Africa who were still eating their old-fashioned plant-based diets. And that's out of which came... Uh, Dennis Burkett's big description of abdominal pressure syndrome. And Dennis Burkett and Utrell thought primarily the biggest difference between the diet was the high fiber diet of naturally occurring plant foods versus the low fiber diet of refined flour, let's say coming from England, the refined, you know, bread and jam, that type of diet makes people sick. Okay, whereas Cleve, Peter Cleve thought the main problem was too much simple sugars, you know, putting a little salt, too much sugar in their tea and, and their jam and other foods. So be that as it may, simple sugars do increase blood triglycerides. Um, and so that's one major pattern of thought traveling down this road of what's causing all these chronic diseases. And I actually think Burkin and Trowell were right in terms of abdominal pressure syndrome and abdominal diseases, and we've talked about that in separate lectures. But abdominal pressure syndrome, going with the westernized diet, also connects in to this uh, lipotoxemia pattern of westernized diseases. Okay? And Pritikin observed, as had others like Trowell and Burkin and Cleve, hey, look, the same countries that eat the low-fiber diet, the high-fat diet, the high-sweetened sugar, you know, simple sugars diet, They've got high rates of all these degenerative diseases, high rates of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, impotence, arthritis, autoimmune disease, hearing loss, and vision loss. In an American hospital, doctors see these diseases all day long, every day. And it's very common that patients will have 10 of them, okay? I can tell you, I look at demented brains every day on brain MRI, and it's sort of like one of my specialty areas is figuring out why did patients become demented. And it is routine. They almost all of them have had cataract surgery. I look at their ophthalmology notes. They've all quite often got multiple vision problems, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, cataract, 
glaucoma. They're a mess. It's sad. I feel sorry for these poor people. But, you know, there's certain things you could be ignorant of, okay? But, you know, if you're ignorant of nutrition, you're pretty much screwed for your health. Okay, next we'll talk briefly about Walter Kempner. You know, I'm almost finished reading um, <clears throat> the scientific publication papers of Walter Kempner. They're quite extraordinary. They're available at the drmcdougall.com website. And, you know, Dr. McDougall has said Kempner might be the greatest doctor who ever lived. I can tell you this. His papers are extraordinary. They're beyond interesting and unusual. They're extraordinary. He was taking care of all these patients back then, and there were no other options. So patients with malignant hypertension, systolic blood pressures around 250, had nowhere else to go. They would try doing a surgical sympathectomy to you know, cut the nerves of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, which quite often didn't work. And then these patients would end up in Kempner's office, and it was almost like a nutritional intensive care unit. And these patients were so sick that he had a, a save rate, you know, kept them alive two out of three. And that was considered incredibly good because they really had no hope otherwise. It was an extraordinary thing to read, okay? And that's what the whole rice diet, low salt, low sodium, low protein. I mean, Kempner had looked around the world at the epidemiology, let's say the Asian populations in particular, and basically saw they had hardly any of these diseases, these problems with hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Um, he had incredible results. Okay, so that's a topic for a separate day. Nathan Pritikin, looked at the epidemiology as well of northern Mexico, comparison of the Tarahumara with the Pima. And the Tarahumara in northern Mexico, the Sierra Madre Mountains, uh, they're incredible. They're world famous for being ultra marathoners. Um, they eat the local uh, plant-based diet with a lot of corns and beans, local greens. Uh, and they had incredible endurance, all right? So basically, Nathan Pritikin noticed, you know, I've got all these fat, sick people on the one hand eating this high, the standard American diet's about 45% fat. And it generates people that by the time they reach 50, they tend to be fat, pre-diabetic, or fully diabetic, and hypertensive with coronary artery atherosclerosis. William C. Roberts, you know, the, probably the best uh, coronary artery cardiac pathologist in the world, he also said, look, humans are herbivores. You take a herbivore, you feed them a high-fat diet, 100% get atherosclerosis. It's not just, you know, a certain percent. It's 100% of them. They all do. Okay, humans are herbivores. They eat a high-fat diet. They all end up with atherosclerosis. It's variable when they present, you know, with MI or other related diseases, but they all get it, okay? And Nathan Pritikin concluded that the excessive dietary fat was the number one main problem with the westernized standard American diet. And he felt that the key mechanism by which it was damaging all these different organisms and systems, causing all these different varieties of chronic disease, was the fat-induced hypoxia. By the way, there's a phrase in medicine, an AO, and that can mean antioxidants when you're talking about you know, plant-based diet, but AO also means academic orgasm. And I can tell you, this idea of combining numerous diseases under the causation mechanism of lipotoxemia due to fat thickening the blood, then leading to decreased oxygen delivered to tissue, that's an extraordinarily brilliant concept that explains a ton of stuff. Okay, so red blood cells typically a little bit bigger than a capillary. RBC is about seven microns, capillary about five microns. So the RBC, when it goes through the capillary, it has to fold on itself and deform a little bit. Um, if the RBC is too stiff because of excessive amounts of saturated fat in its membranes, it can't deform as well. I know you've heard me say this before, but I have to repeat this again for people who haven't seen those other lectures. Also, the LDL cholesterol elevated by the increased fat intake that will overcome the zeta potential of the RBC, stick the RBCs together. That's what Rouleau is about. Again, I talked about all this stuff in the atherosclerosis part one lecture, but people need to know that, that the fat sticks everything together. Just like oil is a big mess when you're cleaning up in the kitchen after a meal. If somebody cook with oil, I hate when they do that. Um, fat sticks all the red blood cells together, and it's a big mess inside your arteries. We're not made to eat high-fat meals. We're just not. You know, maybe rarely, fine, but on a routine basis, it is damaging to blood flow. Okay, um, peak lipemia. This is a great experiment of Peter Quo, the Philadelphia cardiologist from the 1950s and 60s. And basically, when he fed people a lot of saturated fat, that's the black line here. These were cardiac angina patients at peak lipemia. I know some of you have heard this before, but I've got to repeat it for this talk. I'll be brief. But peak lipemia at five hours, that's right when they also had peak repeat episodes of cardiac angina. So he intentionally fed high-fat meals to cardiac angina patients. 
um, an induced cardiac angina. Okay, luckily they didn't have a myocardial infarction. All right. Um, and then there was a big push for unsaturated fats. The experiments were repeated in the 1960s, unsaturated fat. And it was then shown that the unsaturated fat from all these different types of oils was even worse. Um, it had a more persistent thickening and sludging of the blood. So you can call this Rouleau formation, sticking RBCs together. It can also be an earlier effect from the chylomicrons, the earliest phase of fat absorption from the gut to the blood. Um, it can also be from elevated triglycerides in the blood for whatever the reason. When they were fed, and so that's the red line, unsaturated fat. The black line is saturated fat meal. And the green line here is a meal with no fat, like a carbohydrate-only meal. And that did not raise the blood lipids at all. Okay, and there were no anginal episodes during that time. So the angina occurring uh, during, during peak ischemia is a good indicator that that the peak lipemia, that the lipemia is what was causing the ischemia. So let's go on to some other topics related to lipotoxemia. So lipotoxemia means lipid or fat. Emia just means in the blood. So toxic blood due to high fat. Um, the next thing to talk about, we talked about Meyer Friedman, Ray Rosenman in the past, polyunsaturated fats. They, they could see it with a microscope, the arteries and the capillaries occluding in real time. Um, Roy Swank had shown similar things in, a, in the cheek pouches of a hamster. Nowadays, they look under the tongue at the sublingual arteries and do all kinds of experiments to compare diets and other effects on arterial flow. Um, Otto Warburg had shown uh, in tissue cultures in vitro that when you drop oxygen supply by 35% or more, it causes, uh, induces cancer. All right. So what we're looking for here is what's a unifying mechanism for chronic disease. And obviously they're multifactorial and there's multiple things that contribute, but there is a key powerful disease causing factor here and it is excessive dietary fat. There's a tremendous difference between the diseases obtained by a standard American diet of 45% fat compared with 100% vegan diets at 10% fat or less. Okay, the, the person's eating the high fat diet, they're really sick and they got tons and tons of problems. Okay, what else? Uh, the higher the fat, the more cancer, especially breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. Whatever happens with breast tends to be the same thing with prostate. Colon is also similar because all that high fat diet means more bile is needed to digest the fat, more bile gets into the colon, and there's other reasons too, but um, it dramatically increases the risk of colon cancer. The Papua New Guinea, uh, population smoked a lot of cigarettes, as did the Japanese, but they had relatively low rates of lung cancer uh, because of the low cholesterol, it's thought. Therefore, they got less tissue hypoxia. Okay, um, the high-fat diets also associated with high levels of uric acid increases the amount of gout as arthritis. But gout, yeah, it's interesting, but it's uncommon type of arthritis. DJD, degenerative joint disease, also called osteoarthritis. That is the most common type of arthritis. That is about 95% of arthritis, okay? And it's not just because the patients are fat, more fat sitting on the bones causing uh, degeneration of the bones. It's also uh, due to ischemia of those joints. It's hard for anything in the body to heal unless it has good blood supply. So you superimpose two problems, fat person on top of an ischemic joint, ischemia means lack of blood flow, that joint's going to undergo more damage. Initially, it'll just be painful and it'll look normal. You know, a lot of people have joint pain and it looks normal, their x-rays initially, but they chronically stay fat, they chronically eat a high-fat diet, the joint starts to become destroyed. And then it becomes, you know, irreversible to some extent. High-fat diet causes insulin resistance and diabetes. So there's a lot of good lectures on insulin resistance. I got a couple at this site. Dr. McDougall's got good lectures on it. Nathan Pritikin's lectures, you can still watch them on the Internet. You can watch like six hours of Nathan Pritikin lectures. And the bottom line, this was shown back in the 1920s with the Sweeney paper, Hemsworth paper, so 1930s and 1940s. Rabinowich out in Canada did great work also on clarifying that diabetes is due to increased dietary fat. And Kempner, to reverse his diabetes patients, he put them on essentially the lowest possible fat somebody could eat is around 4 or 5%. Okay, and they got better. Because a lot of times you're going to hear people say, oh, you know, for treatment of diabetes, carbohydrate restriction. And I personally think that is ignorant. Okay, it's been shown by over, you know, about 100 years of data that the best diet for diabetics is a starch-based diet. And you can tell, look around at the world, the epidemiology, the plant, the populations that eat that, they don't have any diabetes next to zero. Okay, it's, it's obvious if you look at the epidemiology. 
And I can tell you, most people don't know that. Very few do. Everybody thinks, oh, diabetes is a sugar disease, carbohydrate disease. No, it's not. It's a lipid disease. And so anybody who's well informed on that knows that. And most people don't know that, including people who should know that, but they don't know that. Okay, high fat diet uh, causes thickening of the blood and Pritikin and McDougall emphasize the high fat component of the diet is causing hypertension. But I can tell you there's other great uh, physician scholars who have really emphasized the sodium component. And that includes Walter Kempner. He would get his sodiums on his patients down to as low as sometimes 50 milligrams per day. That was thought about the minimal safe amount. The Yanomamo uh, population in South America, indigenous population, still eating their old-fashioned plant-based diet, separate from all the cities, you know, out in the jungle area. They have a salt intake of around 200 milligrams per day sodium intake, and they have no hypertension. All their old people, no hypertension. Okay, uh, so you know what do I think? I think it's both. You know, obviously, sodium is a major contributor. It doesn't make that big a difference when you lower your sodium a little bit from, let's say, 3,000 milligrams a day to 2,000 milligrams a day, but it does make a big difference if you get from, you know, that 3,000 milligrams down to 200 milligrams a day. Okay, sorry about the dogs. Um, and then hearing loss due to atherosclerosis and ischemia is much more common in the Western countries. Uh, Nathan Pritikin summarized the three major problems with high dietary fat, tissue hypoxia, diabetes, elevated cholesterol leading to atherosclerosis. Okay, Pritikin, Pritikin said that he felt that the high-fat diet was the major cause of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, vision loss, hearing loss, and senility. So senility was the word he used for dementia. And also he felt for cancer. So it's kind of a big statement, obviously. So what, what's basically being said here is if high-fat diet is what's causing all these things, a low-fat diet, to some extent, might help prevent all these things. That was the opinion of Pritikin, and I actually think there's a lot of truth in that. The more fat a person eats, the more likely they are to become obese. The higher percentage of their calories are from fat. That's one of the reasons why I think it's great to eat white rice. I think it's great to eat potatoes, because those have very low fat. They create healthy populations. You know, a billion out of a billion Chinese persons was skinny when they ate a rice-based diet. Take a look at the Chinese now. While they're eating more and more meat and oils, they got tremendous problems with obesity and diabetes. Okay. Um, hypertension too goes with obesity, and it also goes with um, high salt diet and a high fat diet. Diabetes caused by the dietary fat. Arthritis. We talked about that, but you know, a dietary fat-induced hypoxia due to Rouleau and chylomicrons and excessive triglycerides. The vision loss diseases. All the common vision diseases. Um, which is like cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, um, glaucoma, hypertension. They're all vascular diseases of one little variation, variations on a Bach fugue. Uh, hearing loss, much more common in Western countries because they get blockages in the arteries to the, the nerves related to hearing, so they lose their hearing. Okay, These are preventable things. These are not inevitable parts of aging. These are part of lipotoxemia. Okay. Minimize your dietary fat, and you're less likely to get any of these things. Same thing with senility. Now, there's multiple things that cause dementia, so-called brain degeneration. All right, but vascular uh, blockages and decrease in oxygen due to thick blood. In my opinion, as a brain doctor looking at brains every day, I believe that is the number one cause by far. Yes, I'm familiar with the beta amyloid theory. I'm familiar with the iron degeneration theories with the uh, oxidative stress theories, and I think all of those things contribute. The aluminum theory, I think all of that stuff contributes to brain degeneration, and I think a big one is excitotoxicity. We've talked about that before in other lectures in the hippocampus. So that was, those are all big subjects. They're all contributory, but this is like, you know, an easy thing to prevent this vascular disease. Just don't eat high fat, okay? And also spinal degenerative disease. I got a separate lecture on that. I wrote a book about that. Ischemic spine is the most common cause of back pain. Um, that's not widely recognized. You know, Neil Bernard had once written about how ischemia was a common cause of a degenerative disc disease in the lumbar spine. I can tell you, after looking at many, many thousands of spines and reading all the literature on it and studying it, it doesn't just cause degenerative disc disease in the lumbar spine. It causes degeneration of the entire spine, and it leads subsequently to 
uh, dish, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, as well as ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, and then multi-level fusion, autofuse spine with muscle atrophy. It's like spine failure, okay? All right, so now, you know, based on all this knowledge, what does Pritikin recommend? Pritikin, back in those days, there was less awareness of the benefits of a plant-based diet. So he started out recommending 15% fat, which was probably because he allowed a little bit of animal foods in his diet, which I think was a mistake. I think he basically was wimping out a little bit to the peer pressure. Uh, Dr. McDougall said he thinks he probably did it for social acceptance, that he himself was moving towards being a vegetarian, a pure vegetarian. So I don't know for sure. But that was, to me, that's like ignorant to allow any um, animal products. But, you know, the pressures were, were quite intense on him at that time because here's this guy who's not even a physician, and he's basically figuring out all this nutritional dietary stuff that the experts uh, didn't know. He's like, a high, he's like a college dropout, but the guy was a major genius. You study him, you'll see. Um, so what else? Dr. Esselstyn has got the best results of any doctor in the world for coronary artery prevention. Dr. McDougall, best nutrition doctor in the world. Dr. Campbell, right up there. Um, uh, myself, all recommend 0% animal foods. Zero. Not one bite of meat. Not one drop of dairy. None. Forget about all that stuff. Now, I realize there's no freestanding population in the world that's 100% vegan. But I figure my audience is mostly people from you know modern areas kind of a high intelligence, motivated, intellectually curious crowd. And, you know, you probably ate meat or other processed food when you were younger. And in a sense, you have to detox. You've already got some atherosclerosis. You've already accumulated some heavy metals and things you don't want. So you want to be as optimal in your diet as you can be. There's nothing in meat or dairy that you need. Zero. Okay. So you want to optimize things as best you can so you can age as well as possible and enjoy your life and not be bothered with health problems. Okay. Uh, I'm 58. I have zero health problems. And, you know, 100% low-fat vegans quite often will be in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s with zero health problems, okay? When I say zero health problems, I mean zero chronic health problems. Um, all right, what else? Uh, Kempner's rice diet's about 95.5, 90% carbohydrate, 5% protein, 5% fat. Standard plant-based diet, 100% vegan diet that's low-fat is going to be about 80-10-10, 80% carbohydrate, 10% protein, 10% fat. Pritikin was recommending to keep your total cholesterol below 160. I can tell you the more standard recommendation now amongst the experts like Esselstyn, McDougall, Colin Campbell, myself, the Framingham study is to keep it below 150. I'd even try to keep it below 140. My total cholesterol, by the way, is 93. Uh, avoid simple sugars because simple sugars lead to increased uh, triglycerides in the blood. You don't want that. Minimize your sodium. And one of the best ways to do this is avoid processed foods. I'd recommend Avoid all processed foods. The only mildly processed food I'll eat is I'll eat plain oatmeal with no ingredients in it. Nothing in it, but just plain oatmeal. Try to get the less processed versions of oatmeal too. The less processed, the better. The more fiber it's going to have. The slower the starch will be digested. The more work your gut has to do. You want that because it slows down the rate of glucose absorption from your gut to the blood. Of course, eat more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, tubers. You'll get plenty of fiber from your plant foods. What about essential fats? Don't worry about essential fats. As Pritikin said, one bowl of oatmeal gives you more than enough linoleic acid. That's the omega-6, C18, with two double bonds that you need. Basically, Pritikin had said it, fat is bad. You want to minimize your fat intake. No matter what type of fat you're talking about, there's some problem with it, more than you'd guess. Okay, um, here's just an example of why do I think potatoes and white rice are so great. Look at this, 1% fat. You can't beat that. 1% fat for potatoes and for white rice. They're also low in protein. That is good. You want to lower your protein intake. You want to lower your fat intake. So potatoes and rice are like magic in that sense. All right. And then I got some other starches here listed and some fruits and the meat foods. Meat foods are a disaster. Okay. Look at salmon. I mean, it's a disaster. 50% fat, 50% protein. How could you be healthy eating that, okay? And all of them are bad because they all either got a lot of fat or a lot of animal protein, and both of those things are bad. The meat has nothing to offer you. Um, fruits can be pretty good. Um, tastes good, too. Fruits are a little expensive. Starches are cheaper. 
This is just a slide real quick. I've shown this in other talks, especially my omega-3 fish oil talk. And you get plenty of omega-3s, omega-6s from your, uh, from your, your plant food. So it's sort of a non-issue. Okay, so now here are just some references, uh, some of the things we talked about. Um, basically, if you want to see the best summary of Nathan Pritikin's work, I would say this is a great book. This is the Pritikin Program for Diet and Exercise. It came out in 1979. It's a masterpiece, especially the section at the end, the rationale for his dietary choices. His other book, Pritikin Promise, this is not as good. This is more like sort of promoting his Pritikin Clinic, and it had a little bit of good stuff in it, but it wasn't as great. His legacy book was great. That was the one that came out posthumously in 1988. That's available at drmatugal.com website. That's a great book. Um, it really shows his thinking, and he goes through hundreds of pages on his lipotoxemia theory, and it's brilliant. Um, so anyways, uh, hope that's helpful to you.